sure you've got this? He looked at me with a signature smirk and waited for me to respond. I took a moment to think about it. Did I really want to do this? And on the last day of school? What if I got in trouble? What if my parents found out? I hesitated for a moment, shuffling in my seat on the long bench in the cafeteria of Thomas Elementary School in Fresno, California. Nathaniel gave me a pitying smile. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. He turned to Nadia and frowned. I told you she wouldn't do it. Nadia shrugged and gave me a disappointed look before she turned back around and ducked her head closer to Nathaniel's. They whispered away, the back of their heads bobbing as they plotted excitedly, coming up with a new strategy now that their plan had fallen apart. They had given up on me just like that. I don't know what I had expected. Nathaniel Sosa and Nadia Franco were the most popular kids in school. Of course, they weren't counting on the school nerd to get the job done. I took a deep breath, weighing my options. I could do what they wanted me to do and become one of the coolest kids in Thomas Elementary's short history. Or I could do the right thing, like I always did, every single day. I had earned a reputation in my elementary school for being the nicest and smartest kid around. The fortune that my teachers and friends knew didn't talk in class unless her hand was raised, got advanced scores on all of her CSTs, and received rave reviews from teachers on the comment sections of progress reports. I won awards at every school assembly, and was deemed student of the month for September every single year since kindergarten. I was the kind of student my teachers bragged to other teachers about. A teacher's dream, a star student, an archetype. Predictable, reliable, ordinary. And that suited me just fine. At 12 years old, there was nothing I wanted more than to blend into the background, to be like everyone else. That hadn't always been easy. In the sea of children at Thomas Elementary, I was one of only five black kids, and the only one of those with a last name longer than four syllables. I easily had a couple of inches and a couple more pounds on the rest of my classmates, and my brown face in shock of gravity-defying curly black hair never failed to stand out against the others in class photographs. So for the majority of my elementary school experience, I stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I tried to combat the obvious otherness of my physical appearance by being the blandest version of myself that I could while I was at school. While inside my home, I cursed like no 12-year-old kid had any business doing and killed time by playing Jack and Ratchet and Clank on my brother's PlayStation and RuneScape on our desktop computer, the fortune that I was at school spent recess in the library and could manage little other than a smile and a giggle when addressed by my teachers and peers. Soon, switching between the fortune I was in the comfort of my home and the vanilla version of fortune that I was when I was surrounded by my classmates and teachers became second nature. For years, I didn't know which version of myself was a real one, or even which one I liked more. It was only when I got to the sixth grade that last obstacle on the path of primary education before I was launched into the literal hell that was middle school in the throes of adolescence that I got tired of my dull facade. Every day I got closer to my promotion was one filled with insecurity and restlessness. Suddenly, the last thing I wanted to be was unremarkable. I wanted to stand out, to be known for more than my grades or my timid and kind demeanor. I wanted to be more than goody two-shoes, to know what it felt like to break out of the box I had confined myself to, go against the rules, have fun. So when I had overheard Nadia and Nathaniel the week before planning a huge food fight for the last day of school, I saw my chance and took it. They needed someone else to start the food fight so that they, the usual suspects, wouldn't get into trouble. Someone totally unexpected who nobody would look to or even think of when shit hit the fan. And I fit the bill. <laughs> Nadia turned to look at me over her shoulder, her dark brown eyes scrutinizing me closely. So you're not going to do it anymore. She gave me an all too familiar look, the look I had received from teachers and staff and other kids for most of my life. It was a mix of curiosity, pity, and confusion, as if at once wondering what I was all about and at the same time not wanting to find out. It was as if the look she had given me had broken a spell. I didn't feel like myself as I turned around in my seat, reached toward my lunch tray, and grabbed an orange slice. In the next instant, I had tossed it across the cafeteria, straight into the eyes of a former classmate of mine. He let out a pained howl. As if it were a signal, the cafeteria erupted with noise and action. Gray mashed potatoes and cubed turkey went flying through the air. Plastic pouches of milk exploded against the walls, covering the character counts decorations and star stickers in a sticky brown film. 
I glimpsed the word trustworthiness plastered on the wall, once a beautiful sparkly blue color and now covered in layers of gravy. I took a moment to admire the chaos I had caused. This flurry of action and motion was the most exciting thing I had ever witnessed, let alone contributed to, in my whole life. I thought that seeing my handiwork would fill me with joy and pride, urge me to grab the rest of the food on my plate and launch it against the walls, or at the frantic teacher's assistants running around and trying to get control of the situation. All I felt, though, was guilty. I looked at Mr. Garza, our janitor. He was leaning against the stage near the front of the cafeteria, a broom in one hand and a dustpan in the other, looking more tired than ever. Something about seeing him there, waiting, as food and curse words and laughter flew around him made me so damn sad. Suddenly, I felt like the single worst person in the whole world. I wanted it all to stop. For me to be back in the library, reading about Charlie Bone and Maggie Fulcart, the characters from the books I loved, who did the right thing, and not the thing that everyone else wanted them to do, who didn't make Mr. Garza's job even harder, or ignore the disappointed looks from their friends who were now ducking under the table to avoid being splattered with junk. I decided then that maybe being goody two-shoes wasn't such a bad idea. At least I hadn't hurt anyone back when I was following the rules. My thoughts were interrupted by the distinct sound of a whistle cutting through the air. What on God's green earth is going on here? Mr. Nelson's voice thundered across the cafeteria from where he stood at the back exit. Panic washed over me like a flood as his once familiar voice, now unrecognizably warped with anger and frustration, reverberated against the walls. Silence swallowed the cafeteria. I didn't want to look up. I kept my eyes locked on the lunch platter in front of me. It was completely untouched, except for the vacant top right corner where my orange slices had once been. I watched as a steady stream of gravy slid down the side of a pile of mashed potatoes. The plastic pouch full of chocolate milk lurched over the side of the lunch tray and landed onto the table with an exhausted plop. I looked up, just as Mr. Nelson's footsteps rang out against the linoleum floor of the cafeteria. He made his way to the front of the large room, to where he suspected all the commotion had originated. I held my breath and waited for the dreaded moment when he would walk by the bench I was sitting at with the rest of my sixth grade class. I was sure that when he got to our row, he would stop, turn on his heel, and look straight at me with eyes full of the kind of unbridled rage and crushing disappointment that was reserved solely for elementary school principals. I remember wishing that I had Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility to wrap around myself so that I could disappear into thin air. Sadly, no owl swooped in through the window and plopped a package in front of me in my time of need, so I waited for my inevitable fate, unable to take my eyes away from the empty compartment on my lunch tray. Why the hell had I thrown those damned oranges? Why did I ever talk to Nadia or Nathaniel in the first place? Why was I trying so hard to be everything I had never wanted to be? To be seen, to be noticed, when just a few weeks ago, I tried so hard to be a fly on the wall that was my life. In that moment, I knew that every good grade, every please and thank you, every perfect test score would go out the window and I'd be done for, irredeemable. I'd no longer be the nice kid or the smart one or the bookworm. I'd be the kid who had started a food fight on the last day of school. Somehow that was worse than anything I had previously considered bad. Suddenly nerd, geek, teacher's pet, or weirdo seemed like the highest praise as possible. At that moment, I would have settled for decent. <laughs> Mr. Nelson passed by the table and I released my once held breath. I was in the clear, I realized. He hadn't even glanced at me. His eyes were focused on Nadia and Nathaniel, who were giggling uncontrollably. I had gotten away with it, just like that. But it didn't feel right. Like that scene in Spirited Away, when Chihiro accidentally lets out a breath right before she gets to the bathhouse and all the spirits realize that she's a human. Except that I didn't have a haku to take my hand and whisk me into the safety of obscurity when things weren't looking so great. <laughs> I felt like I had revealed my true identity to my friends and everyone who had witnessed my unforgivable sin, especially my former classmate, who was now crying and being led to the nurse's office for pain in his right eye. I watched with wide eyes as Mr. Nelson led Nadia, Nathaniel, and another kid who was innocent but was at the wrong place at the wrong time, toward the back of the cafeteria and to the principal's office to understand the consequences of their actions. But what about my punishment? How could I make up for what I had done? How could I be expected to live with the guilt? That was the second time that day that I felt as if something other than myself had taken over my body. My hand shot into the air, grabbing Mr. Nelson's attention. He turned to me. Not right now, Fartoon. I've got to deal with these two first. I gulped and the words tumbled out of my mouth before I could stop them. I started the food fight. Mr. Nelson frowned and shook his head. What? You don't have to lie for them. Nadia and Nathaniel already told me that they threw the first bread roll. 
No, that was me. But it wasn't a bread roll. It was an orange slice. It hit Tina in the eye. My friends gasped as I further incriminated myself, pointing to the empty space on my lunch tray. See? <laughs> Mr. Nelson shook his head, still obviously confused. After a moment, he sighed and beckoned me over. All right, then. Off to the principal's office you go. I stood solemnly, waving goodbye to my friends, and then heading toward the cafeteria exit. I felt like I was a tragic main character after the ultimate boss fight in a video game, and this was a final cutscene before the music swelled in the background and the credits rolled, followed by the last glimpse of the game's title, The Food Fight. <laughs> I held back tears and made the walk of self-inflicted shame past the rows of gaping classmates and disgusted teacher's assistants. My scuffed Adidas squeaked against the floor, echoing oddly inside of the cafeteria. I walked all the way to the double doors and turned back to the room for the last time, part of me expecting cheers or applause. I was greeted with stunned silence. I turned from the cafeteria and prepared to walk out the door. On my way toward the exit, I caught a flash of color out of the corner of my eye. A solitary orange slice lay skin side down on the ground. It was beautiful, lying there with its unblemished perfection. What a waste. <laughs>